which is a modeling language for digital assets. Um, you can think of it as a smart contract language. So kind of like something where you write your smart contracts that will run on a blockchain or maybe on a less distributed setting in the end. Um, we're working towards being back-end agnostic, meaning running on all different sorts of blockchains or no blockchain at all. Um, yeah, and Daniel is a Haskell-based smart contract programming language. And we actually we are actually using JHC to compile it. And I'll split this talk into two parts. First, I'll do some live demo hacking. I've never liked program before. I talked about it well. <laughs> and afterwards, I'll give some insights on how we um, hacked or botched the compiler such that it does what it does now. Cool. Um, then let's get started with some hacking. I need to switch my window, which works like this. Cool. We um, need a new file, and as some of you know, and some don't, I'm uh, a very enthusiastic cyclist, so if I wouldn't be a software programmer, I would probably work in a bike shop. So let's model some workflows that would happen in a bike shop. Kind of like you want to run your next generation bike shop on blockchain, here's how it goes. <laughs> um, we are currently in version uh, 1.2 of demo. That's what we have to say at the beginning, and then it's up. Quick question. Do you have a light color scheme? It's, it's, or otherwise you need to put down the blinds? Oh. It's, it's on the recording. It's a bit gray, everything. Yeah. I guess I do light. How's that? This is much better. If you could increase the font by two, then uh, we're there. This is how on the video it works. This is great. Is it? Cool. Um, cool. So let's write some Haskell or something Haskell like. Um, the first thing we will need in a bike shop is something to pay. So we need an idea of cash. Right? So let's develop a smart contract for cash. And we can think of it as tokens in other smart contract languages. We use the keyword template to introduce a new contract model or like a new contract template. That's why it's called template. Um, we call it cash and it has a few fields. Cash is issued by somebody. Um, we call them, whoa, the issuer. And the issuer is a party and party is kind of a legal entity. We call them parties in demo and they are first class concepts. Um, cash is owned by somebody which is another party, cash must be in some currency. Okay, we need currencies apparently. I don't know, we clearly need Swissies. I guess we also need dollars, um, euros, no pounds, not relevant anymore. Um, and there's an amount, which is a decimal number. Cool. So, that is almost um, a smart contract for our cash. There's a warning. Oh, right. The warning is telling us, oops, I moved away. We need a signatory. So every smart contract which will end up on the ledger must be signed by somebody um, and we must specify who signed it. So in demo, we say who are the signatories. And for cash, it's two people. First of all, the issuer should sign the smart contract for the cash, right? You don't want to owe me money without saying, oh yes, I want to owe you money. Um, and also the owner needs to sign, kind of like owning cash is a burden, right? It could be the last cent that tips you into the next tax bracket or something. Um, oh, and then we need our cash if instances of E can show. Cool. So that is our very first template, smart contract. Let's try to do something. Um, in demo, we have something called scenarios. And scenarios are a way to run um, smart contract workflows in your IDE. You kind of like can create contracts and you can like evolve the workflows over time all from your IDE. Um, so, 
The first step we need to do is we need to allocate two parties. We clearly need a bank that has issued the cash. So, uh, shut down all useless warnings. So, we need a party called a bank, some Swiss bank, and we need somebody who owns the cash. So, let's say I want to go to the bike shop. So I will need cash. Okay, now we have cash. Next, uh, now we have parties. Next thing we want to do is we want to create cash on the ledger. And what we want to create is, um, let's say, 200 Swiss francs. And they look like this. So they have an issuer, which will be the bank. They have an owner, which will be me. Um, the currency will be Swissies and the amount will be 200. Okay, now, so that is like only a declaration without any side effects. We need to actually create the cash on the ledger. So what we do is we submit a transaction to the ledger. Uh, so let's say I want the cash, so I submit a transaction which does create cash. No, I named it differently. Cool. Okay, so there's a scenario, and as I said, we can use it for testing in the RDE. I can close this, that's useless. Um, cool, so if we try to run the scenario, we get an error. The create failed because the bank has not authorized the transaction, which makes a lot of sense, right? I can't print money. Um, cool, so next thing, we need a way Kind of like the bank needs to propose, hey Martin, here are 200 Swiss francs, do you want to get them? So we need some sort of proposal. And we do not only want to propose cash, later on we're going to propose other things as well, so let's write a generic proposal. So what we write is something like a proposal T. So you can propose something. And there's somebody who proposes the thing which is a party, and there's somebody who will then receive the proposal. Oh. Um, and there's a thing that is proposed, let's say, called a proposal, and that's of type T. And the only party who needs to sign the proposal is the party proposing the thing. Um, so, and we do that by saying the signatory is the proposer. But then, there must be a way for the, uh, for the receiver of the uh, proposal to accept it. And then we do that by something called a choice. So, we have a choice called accept. Um, and when you run it, you get a contract ID of type T. So, kind of like a pointer to something of type T and we call them contract IDs. So contracts are instantiated templates. Um, and somebody needs to uh, run this choice, let's say I want to like execute this choice, and then we call this party the controller. And the controller would be the receiver of the proposal. And then we do something. And what we want to do is we want to create this thing that has been proposed. Um, create proposal. Okay, we get a warning. Ooh. Yeah. So what we need to do is we need to say this T thing is also a template. So like for this T, there must be a template. And since demo has an underlying language which is monomorphic, um, and this proposal is uh, generic or polymorphic, we need to also say we want to propose cash. So we do that by saying um, there's a template instance and we call it a cash proposal, which is a proposal for cash. Cool. And if we do that, we can ask the bank to propose some money. Um, 
Huh? Well, that's what the bank wants to do. <coughs> oh, I'm not the bank. That's the bank. And what we want to create is a proposal. And the proposer is the bank, and the receiver is me, and the proposed thing are the two messages, right? Oh. Okay, now it's passed, and we see the state of the ledger. <coughs> and what's there? There is a cash proposal um, proposed by the Swiss bank, um, received by me, and Here's the payload of uh, the proposal in there. So it's an IRF, it's a cash issued by the bank, owned by me for Swiss francs, 200 of them. Okay, cool. So let's get the cash out. What I need to do is I need to exercise. Uh, I wish I could cut. On um, this proposal, I need to exercise the accept choice. And something has gone wrong. Ooh, okay. What we need to do is somehow the party receiving the proposal needs to know about its existence. And we declare that by saying it observes, it is an observer of this proposal contract. Okay, so when the bank created this proposal, I was pink because I'm the receiver and it told me, hey, here's a new thing. And now, after accepting this proposal, we have cash. Um, 200 to strengths and I own them. Cool. So, next thing we want to do is one workflow in the bike shop is to repair a bike. Um, repair. Bike repair. And who are the parties? Well, there's the bike shop, which is one of the party. There's the bike owner, which is another party. There's a description of what needs to be done. Uh, and there's a price for this whole thing, which is, let's say, a decimal. And the bike shop only accepts Swiss francs. And there is um, a payment date. Okay, I think we will be important to import the date module for this. And for this bike repair, the parties who need to sign it are the bike shop, not the bike show. bike owner. Cool. So let's suppose the bike repair that needs to be done um, is about fixing my brakes. So we also need a bike shop, which we need to allocate on the ledger. Bike repair. So the bike shop will be the bike shop, and the bike owner will be me, and the description will be six brakes, and the price will be, let's say, 50, which would be cheap, I guess. And what's the last thing missing? The paint. mid-September, so 15 of September. No, it's the other way around. Uh, 15. Okay, and we have again the same problem. Like the bike shop can't just create this thing, 
because I need to sign it as well. So we need to run through this proposal workflow again. The workshop proposes, here's how I could, like, here's what you need to pay to get this fixed. Um, and then I can accept it. So again, we need to say there's a template instance, um, why do we care? Proposal, which is a proposal, or why do we care? Now this generic template, which is parameterized by what you want to propose, comes in very handy. So we say there's a bike repair proposal, um, which is submitted by the bike shop. So kind of like I bring my bike there and they make a tell me that's what you need to pay. Um, create a proposal with proposal the bike shop. Um, the receiver would be me again. And the proposal is the bike repair I want to get. Cool. So now put this proposal on the ledger as well. Um, next step is I like this proposal, I think 50 Swiss francs for fixing my brakes is cheap, I'm going to do that. So I get the bike repair. So I submit a transaction which exercises on this proposal. The um, accept choice. Cool. Now we have this bike repair contract on the ledger. The next thing we want to like model is kind of like I need to be able to pay this, right? I would be happy not to, but I need to. So there will be a choice on this bike repair template. Let's say pay and we won't return anything interesting, but we need to like give cash, the cash with which we pay. So we need to give a contract ID of a cash contract. And the person saying I want to pay is the bike owner, so the controller. And what happens? So we need to check that the cash I supply is actually the cash I need to pay. Right? So, um, we need to fetch the cash from the ledger, kind of like dereference the pointer to the cash contract. Um, and then we need to make assertions, which no. doesn't need importing anything. Um, we need to say the cash currency are Swiss francs, and the cash amount is the price for the repair. Now the big font is even better. Uh, perhaps you can go one lower, so I get some extra space. Yeah. Okay. Can everybody in the room still read it? Fortunately, we have a small room. Cool. Um, so this checks that the cash matches the requirements for the payment. But now what we also want to do is we want to transfer the cash from me to the bike shop. Shouldn't the cash also be owned by the bike owner? By the bike owner. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> Thanks. Otherwise I could pay with the cash of the bike shop. <laughs> um, a lot of requirements. And wouldn't the bike shop also care about that it gets some proper Swiss bank cash and not some shitty Nigerian bank no, cash? No. All right. It's very I'll play with Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so probably what Simon suggested would end up kind of like accepted banks and then you would have like a list of parties and things like this, right? They make an offer and tell me you can pay with Swiss bank or shitty Nigerian bank, or Simon's fantasy bank. Um, yeah. Because the other, 
common thing that actually is you, you if you pay with Swiss francs, what you're actually doing is you're paying with cash issued by the Swiss National Bank. Yeah. So the currency is essentially embedded in issue. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's cut scope for this. Excellent. Approved. Thank you. So what we need is a way to transfer cash. Um, and the result of transferring cash will be new cash. So we will delete the old cash and create new cash. Um, and we need to say who will be the new owner of the cash. There will be some party. Um, and to make this happen, who can like exercise this choice? So the person giving away the cash should clearly agree, right? So let's say um, the owner of the cash can do this, and then what we do is we create cash with. Uh, the owner is the new owner. No, wait, not cash. We create this with this magic keyword, which also exists in Java, which refers to like your own contract instance. And the choice, if you if you have a choice, you always archive the contract you're currently operating on. So this one will destroy the cash you're operating on and create new cash. Actually, one thing I notice is that there's quite a few new syntactic features over Haskell. And I'm also not sure like, well, how, how the audience, how much, who is at what level of Haskell, perhaps. If somebody has questions on the syntax, um, that would be a good point to ask. It's human readable. It's kind of like, that's <laughs> <laughs> well, we can check that now. <laughs> Who's very comfortable with the syntax? <laughs> okay. Test passed. <laughs> cool. Um, so, so you, you said the choice will always archive the current yeah. instance of the yeah. item on the blockchain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a way to avoid that, which mm -hmm. is called a non consuming choice. Okay. Yeah. But I won't use them today. Um, yeah. <coughs> okay, so this is the transfer. And what we need to do now is we need to. Um, on the cache, I supply. Ah, Xer. We need to exercise transfer with new owner. So equals bike shop. What did I do? Oh, yeah. don't really care about the cache ID, right? If you write a full application using demo, you will listen to like a ledger API and ledger API will tell you about all the things that they've created. So the bike shop would see like on this event stream my cache has been created. And then they know how to use it. Why was it important to assert that the cache belongs to the um, to the bike owner? Because <coughs> in a transfer you have probably that security ingrained that the owner of the cache has to accept that transfer. Yeah. So you could theoretically nominate anybody to pay for your bike retailer, right? Yeah, so there's, we have this uh, concept of authorization. Mm -hmm. And it's like always that some people, like if you're in one of those choice bodies, um, you have an authorization scope. Mm -hmm. And there you need to, um, in, and every create and every exercise also like needs specific um, authorizations to be in scope. Okay. So the question, the question is right. If you didn't put that assertion there, it would still fail on the transfer because you don't have the exactly. right authorization. I'm just sorry. Unless, unless you transfer cash yeah. off the bike shop to itself, then it would not fail. Right, but I was saying, in this case, it would actually it would have caught you even if you didn't put that assertion. Yeah, no off, right? So we should try it later. Remove the assertion later yeah. and see that it see if it still catches you. <laughs> yeah, sure. And we can then pay with the bike shop's cash as yeah. well. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. But good question. Um, so maybe you should assert owner is not the bike shop. Well, maybe the bike shop wants to actually repair something at its <laughs> own place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why should we stop them from doing that? 
Okay, cool. Um, so now we have a payment choice, but we don't have. We need fifty Swiss francs, but we only have two hundred Swiss francs. Yeah. Hmm. So what we need is another way for cash. You cannot only transfer it; you can also split it. So we basically turn one cash into two cash. So I would split the. 200 into 50 and 150. So let's model that. Contract ID cash. Contract ID cash. And we need to define where we want to split. So split amount is a number. And we want to say the owner can do that. And what we want to assert is that. Um, the split amount is between zero and different amount. Ooh, and I missed one big feature. And then we want to create this watch. So we get ID one will be this with um, amount the split amount, and ID two will be. And then we're going to return ID1 and ID2. Okay, one thing I missed in the very beginning is we want to make sure there's no negative cash. Like that doesn't make too much sense. Um, so, would I mean you wouldn't need that assertion? You don't need it strictly done. If you want to get a nice error message, you should do something like this. Class, That's not nice, nice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people got the idea. Cool. Um, okay, so now we can split the cash. So we're going to get 50 francs and 100 francs, and we're going to get IDs of prices. Um, and I submit the transaction. So. Okay, so now we have two spills on the um, on the ledger, and finally, I want to use that cash to actually pay. So what I want to do is I exercise on the bike repair ID pay. my 50 francs and boom something failed okay do you get the whole transaction and how it got um, yeah we could debug this now long story short we messed something up in the transfer so as I said, if you own, if you are made to own cash, you want to sign that, right? And here, the new owner of the cash has not really signed that they want to own the cash. Um, only the issuer and the owner have signed something, and the owner has signed again by submitting the transfer request. But the new owner has had no choice to um, sign this. So. What we could do is we could create a proposal and then they could accept it. Or alternatively, we could do we could say the old owner and the new owner need to exercise this choice in conjunction. Like they both need to sign the choice, um, and that is exactly what happened here in this payment choice because both the bike shop and the bike owner have signed this contract. And with that, they've signed all its consequences as well. So meaning they've signed the transfer. Does that make sense? That's probably as complicated as it gets today. 
it would also suffice if only the bike owner would be a signatory, wouldn't it? Because the bike owner is the controller of the choice, so he actually approves that local compact there. That one? Sorry, if, if only the bike shop was a signatory, because the payment choice is controlled by the bike owner. Yeah, but I don't want the bike shop to repair my bike if I don't want it. Totally understood there. <laughs> Just checking, I don't understand. Only very specific bike shops can touch my bike. Not surprised. <laughs> cool. Okay, um, so that is pretty much the happy part, and what we end up with in the end is there are still 150 Swiss francs in my name, and now there are also 50 francs in the name of the bike shop. And if we look at all the archive stuff, we will see, for instance, the bike repair is still there, but it has been archived when I paid. Um, so this whole model right now has a big flaw. If I don't, if I never pay, nothing happens. So what we probably would want is that the bike shop has kind of like a way to send me a notice. So there would be a notice choice, um, which is controlled by the bike shop, but they can only do that once the payment date has been passed. So we would want to say they can only do it after this date. So we say after time um, and then we use the payment date and make month. Ooh, and we need time library kind And then um, we would create like a notice or something. Um, let's not get into the details of this. And then this notice would have like off ledger effect or somebody could, I don't know, sue me or something, whatever. Okay, cool. Does all of this make sense so far? Any questions? Yeah. I'm just to get it right. So, if you basically have a signature to, to some contract and it has like consequences, like for example, the other party doing the choice, mm -hmm. where again you're the signatory, you automatically sign as well the consequence. Yeah. Isn't that dangerous, or aren't there scenarios where this could be abused? You, you kind of like need to audit everything you sign. So. Um, otherwise, like, you would need to sign everything over and over again, all the transactions, right? right. And you could kind of like, um, I agree with you on something, and then you want to do it, and I stop you from doing it, mm -hmm. if I had to sign again, right? So kind of like, I delegate my authority, I sign once, and then all the consequences that whatever happen are authorized by me. There might be kind of multi-stage decisions, right? Where yeah. you kind of agree in the first stage, but then the second stage is maybe, I don't know, first you do a plan and then you build something, but yeah. on the building you still want to have another decision point. Yeah, you you, you sign all the fallout, so you, uh, you should not do this uh, lightly. But actually what you describe is, so you could distinguish between the cases where you already pre-signed you only sign on the immediate consequences. And if this immediate consequence has you as a signature again, mm -hmm. then you sign the consequence of that consequence again. But if there's no signature of you, if you're not the signature there, like on the plan where you want to prove again, mm -hmm. you would see that a plan is created where you are still an observer but not a signature, mm -hmm. and you might have a choice there to actually prove it. Okay. So you can model both of these cases where you have this long transitive chain. All right, because you can basically make the choices so that each party gets whatever responsibilities they should have. Yes. Okay. And, and you also see this nicely in this uh, double, the, the choice which is controlled by two people. Mm -hmm. Like, you can either decide to really delegate your signatory authorization to one of the parties of the contract. Mm -hmm. Because they are us too, if you have another contract that tells that mm -hmm. we should do that, we will do that. I think I was confusing signatures and controllers. I think that's that's the difference, right? Essentially. Yeah. Um, one important thing is in this choice. So kind of like if you exercise the choice, you have like an authority uh, authority context around, right? Like mm -hmm. some people have uh, authorized something, and then there's this exercise of the choice, and everything that is happening as follow up of this choice, we cut the authority to the signatories of the template you exercise the choice on and the controllers. 
Mm -hmm. But there's like always a cut, so you can always reason locally about this. Um, okay. And as Simon said, if you become a signatory on something that is created in this choice, you basically pass your authority on. If there's nothing really signatory, you don't pass it on. Ooh, silly question, but how does the plugin know which one to display and write? Why is it showing the cache as opposed to, I don't know, bike repair, for instance? Um, right now it's showing the whole ledger, so everything that is still active. Mm. And the bike repair has been archived when I paid. Okay. So you can click show archive and then you see everything that has happened. No, I yeah. So that's kind of like the audit tree. Yeah. Yeah. And you can also click on the transaction view if you are adventurous. Cool. Any further questions so far? Okay, then let's change the year and look into how we build all of this based on top of DHC. So maybe I should give like a bit of uh, historical context to all of this. Um, when I joined the A, there was already a programming language which was called demo 0.1, I think, or maybe 0.0. .0. Um, and at some point, so this was kind of like a curly brace language, and at some point people decided like something like Haskell would be neater. So then there was demo 1.0, which looked a lot like Haskell, but had a custom compiler. So we had our own compiler. It was basically like a simpler version of Haskell. Um, and yeah, I'm thinking of it. I think it's more to back here. Maybe that's an open research problem. <laughs> I find these bikes always these switches are utterly confusing. It's, <laughs> it's this way, you press every one and it just ah, 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 ah. How many PhDs does it take to? I can just talk faster so that we don't need No, to. your face is almost black on the oh, screen, that's a little pain. Are you trying to be racist? <laughs> I'm not. Um, so, where did I stop? I think I said we had demo 1.0, which had look, looked a lot like Haskell, but wasn't Haskell. We had our own compiler. And then we had a back-end language, an intermediate language, which is called demo LF. LF stands for ledger fragment, because that is what is running on the ledger. And for this intermediate language, we had an interpreter, which is running as part of the ledger. Um, we call it the demo engine. So. That is kind of like the historical setup we had. And at some point we decided, why should we keep our own compiler? Like, that's just a pain, right? Like we had a compiler full of type checker bugs. We didn't have nested pattern matching. We didn't have type classes. All the nice stuff you like from Haskell, we didn't have it. Um, so the conclusion was we tried to take GHC, at least GHC's front end, and use it to produce this demo LF intermediate language. Um, the syntax between our old language and Haskell was so close that we could write update scripts, which were basically set scripts, and they did like 95% of the work. So it was worth a try. Um, and that is kind of like, we had the surface syntax we wanted to use, which is mostly the template-based stuff, not really the expression language. And we had this uh, intermediate language called demo.lf. And what we were looking for was like a way to like plug GHC's front end in, like in between those two. That's what we did, and that is what I want to talk about in the rest. Um, and just to recall, that's kind of like how the GHC compiler pipeline looks like. Um, you have Alexa and the parser, which gives you a parse tree. Then you run it through something called renamer and type checker, which does name resolution, um, type checking, and also type inference. 
Then you run it through the desugara, which produces GHC core and throws away all syntactic sugar like nested pattern matchings, um, do syntax, pet classes are resolved into dictionary parsing style, um, all that kind of stuff. Then the next pass is the simplifier, which runs like simplification transformations on GHC core. Um, then this whole stuff is converted to this fine detected uh, G machine, some sort of graph reduction machine. This one is then plugged into the code generator, which produces C minus minus, which is kind of an LLM like <coughs> intermediate language, but I think GHC is the only project using it. Um, and then there's a machine code generator which produces assembly, or you can also go via LLVM. And I think GHC JS also can be plugged in somewhere there, somewhere up here. Yeah, um, so this is how the GHC pipeline looks like. Um, what we are interested in is definitely not, well, we don't care about this. This is very close to the machine. We also don't care about STG because our intermediate language demo app is basically system F, which is almost the intermediate language of GHC, plus uh, some primitives for the smart contract stuff. Like there's a notion of templates in language and there are primitives for update, uh, updates, for creates and for exercises. So it's basically system F plus smart contract stuff. Um, so we don't care about this and then there's one big difference between demo, as I showed it, and Haskell. Demo is eager, eagerly evaluated, and Haskell is lazy, which means the simplifier is utterly useless for what we do. Um, even the simple transformation, the one called uh, case of case, already assumes laziness, so we have to throw away the simplifier as well. But I think, despite, like, except for the simplifier, the the hardest part is probably the type checker, and that's the one where we hit the most bugs. So luckily we could keep the type checker. And yeah. And the issue sure is fine as well. Yeah, like some parser results. We had a bunch ton of parser bugs because we were mm. in Parsec and it's super hard to understand whether you're uniform or not. Yeah, well mm. and indentation sensitive parsing is yes. a pain as well. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. But I still think the type checker is worse than the parser. Um, cool. So this is how the DHC pipeline looks like. And now let's have a look at how demo pipeline looks like. Demo compiler pipeline. Um, so this is color coded. Red is everything coming from GHC, from vanilla GHC, and blue is all the stuff we did. Blue as in digital as in blue. Um, so what did we do? We kept the type checker and the renamer and the sugary and we left them completely untouched. We haven't touched them at all. What we had to change apparently are the lexer and the parser because we wanted to get in this new template syntax. So we had to add new custom parse rules for the template syntax and the choices and so on. So the question now is how did we get all of this new syntax through this pipeline without changing those two steps? And the trick is, every template is desugared now into a type class. Basically one type class which represents this template. And then there are a few more type class instances, for instance for create and exercise to be polymorphic. So what we do is we take this template syntax and desugar it into, well, data types as well, data types, a type class definition, and a bunch of type class instances. So they and they like we basically should have to stand at Haskell. Then we do some pre-processing, which is not related to the templates at all, but to the records in the text. Um, if you remember, we have written some nice stuff, which makes Haskell people <coughs> jealous, I guess. We read, we've written stuff like hash.currency to refer to the currency of the hash of code. Um, so, and when we handle this, 
is in the preprocessor. So basically, we look for for name dot name and then rewrite it into like the get. There's like this has field class in JHC already, and we basically translate this into a get field of the proper name. So the preprocessor um, mostly cares about this and some not so interesting stuff, which is necessary. Yeah, but doesn't the parser treat it as two different things? If you have a kind yeah. of currency, yeah. so you have to treat that as well, so that it stops trying no. to split and use the dollars and inputs. No, like it, the parser also preserves the spacing. We only do it if there's no spaces in the dog. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to write like function uh, function composition f dot g, you need to write f space dot space g. Yeah. I think you can leave away one of the two spaces, but not both. Okay. Yeah. The other thing which is would be nice to have in Haskell is that we can actually reuse field names. Yeah. It's, well, you kind of can do that, right? The user experience is sort of that. Terrible. <laughs> but I mean, here it just works. Yeah. So this this scheme really works. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's like all these type classes. So we we use sugar uh, templates to some type class instances. So those uh, the type classes need to be in scope. That's another thing the preprocessor does. Always import the modules, which have uh, bring these these things in scope. Cool. Um, so then. We pipe everything through the regular pipe checker and regular sugar up, and then we get some GHC core out. And this is our magic piece in the whole stack. It looks at the GHC core and does something we we tend to call resugaring, kind of like we try to spot the type classes that were uh, generated by the desugaring in the parser. And take those and turn them into temp like into template definitions in Demodev. As I said, there's like the template concept is first class in Demodev or intermediate language. So what we do here is we, we look at type classes of a specific kind and like reassemble them into templates. Um, and then we do some other transformations, like we have built-in types in Demodev for um, Updates, which is what is happening, kind of like ledger updates. Um, we're built in types for scenarios, and we spot all of those things and turn them into the primitive types. Um, but most of, most of that is uh, pretty straightforward, and then the rest is basically converting system F into system F. And um, well, GHC core is system FC, you can't really deal with the C. So sometimes we fail if you try to use things like GADTs, for instance. Um, yeah. So uh, how do you deal with type errors? Do you need to translate them back into the source language in some way? Right now, we don't do that. Um, in the future, we will probably need to do that to make the user experience better. But um, yeah, they're, they're still kind of understandable. Well, we've, for instance, we've named the class, like the type class corresponding to template, template. Oh, yeah. So I think yeah. that helps. But we do yeah. preserve location, so at least we try to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, cool. So after this, we do some post processing, um, which is like some light simplification steps. Um, I found that simplifying strict language is so much harder than simplifying the eagle language because you can't just do that code elimination, right? Your that code might throw ex like your seemingly that code might throw exceptions, which is very sad. So um, and then we do some analysis, kind of like you don't want to put a function on the ledger, right? That doesn't work. So you need like data that is serializable in one way or another, and we don't deem functions to be serializable. So we do some analysis around this in our post-processor, or some inference around this. Um, yeah. And one more thing we do is on the on the no, that we run a type checker, it's a sanity check, so we have uh, I don't know, it's not very hard to fuck up here. So we kind of like want to catch all the mistakes we make, and that was very useful. Um, yeah. And then 
further down the pipeline, we encode everything into Proto up because we need to, like, we also ship our stuff over the network. And kind of like when you want to upload a package to the ledger, you talk to the ledger via Protobuf. So our whole AST is Protobuf, has Protobuf description, and we ship this. Um, yeah. And then <coughs> in the very end, we stick it. And then we have a file, an artifact of the compiler. Um, and one thing I have not shown today is you can, in our IDE, you can get type information. So like we have type compiler. It does not only work with demo, um, it works with Haskell as well. You can use most of this um, as a demo IDE. And you also get go to definition. Um, I have not set it up. I'm, I don't know. I think I still have Stockholm syndrome to shitty Haskell IDE experiences. <laughs> so I don't need that yet. Um, and the last bit is something called the scenario service, which you've seen, like, we've run the scenarios, and then you've seen the feed, uh, like, this widget of, that's how the ledger looks like. So what we do is we basically um, take the demo of AST, ship it to some Scala program, because all of our, uh, the ledger implementation is written in Scala, ship it over there, it runs the scenario, and ships the results back. Um, yeah, cool. That's the whole pipeline, and the last bit, um, Nicola. One more question. So suppose you said that uh, when you have a cache ID and a flow stick, yeah. you generate a new cache ID, right? Yeah. So you have some kind of defined types of some sort? Or finite types. Of finite types. You have an object, and once it went through the function, you can't reuse it. You have to use the one that came out of the function, right? Well, that is only if your choice is consuming. Your choice could um, keep the old thing. But okay. I think the point is it's a runtime error, not a type error, even in the cases where it is consuming. Yeah. So we don't we don't have to find types, so it's just a runtime error. If you oh, think. okay, so it's nowhere in there. You're asking for double spans? Like if you have a contract, the contract was archived, and you, you can still syntactically refer to the contract. Yeah. Maybe it's not a type yeah. error, it will no. just fail at runtime, this yeah. contract yeah. has been archived. Yeah. Maybe it's just a function. Um, cool. Um, and the very last bit I want to talk about is uh, this amazing IDE experience I've just shown you. Um, so how did we build this whole IDE? We've basically built a generic Haskell IDE, which is called Haskell IDE Core. Um, it is driven by an in-memory version of Neo Mitchell's shape library, and on top so for those who don't know, Shape is a like build system as a library. Um, it's used to build GHC, for instance. It's also used to build them these days. And on top of that, we um, use the Haskell LSP bindings, and those talk to Visual Studio Code, which is the engine that I've used by uh, the language server protocol. And then we have like a pretty small extension for Visual Studio Code. Um, and internally the IDE, so like this, the shape build system needs rules, build rules, and those rules basically drive the uh, compiler stages. And there is the Haskell IDE core rules, which drive the Haskell part of the pipeline until the Dishogara. And then we have some more rules, which are basically you can plug more rules into this Haskell IDE core library, um, which drive the rest of our compiler pipeline. And you can also plug in a preprocessor. So it's a uh, tailor made for what we do. And Neil is using this part for uh, actually writing Haskell. Um, so it's a standalone library. It should work. I have not tried it or its test. Um, and I built that for. So it's working, but yeah, we need we need to work on, on using it. Um, cool. So and if you plug all of this together, you get very happy users. <laughs> um, cool. So how do we go from here? If you found this interesting, the language you can download the SDK on demo.com. Um, if you want to play with the example I made just on GitHub, 
Um, I guess you will put the slides online. Yeah. Cool. So if you, when after you guys put the slides online, you can like click here, and then you get to the gist of what I've just written. Maybe it's slightly different, um, but it should be the same in general. Yeah. Um, if you play around in the documentation, you can find it here. If you want to know more stuff, you can follow us on Twitter. Um, yeah, and if you want to look at how we hack all of this together, that's our repository. And if you want, just want to play with it without downloading it, there is um, we're working on a demo as a service as well, but it's um, it's in the pre alpha state. We also do have the web ID. Say again? We also do have the web ID. We also do have a web ID, that's true. Is um, it an intended upgrade to the last version? That is a question <laughs> I can't answer because yeah, uh, team team devil. No, it's oh, not it's it's up to date. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can try it's it. web Yeah. It's also linked from the demo web page. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you want to try the web IDE Simon is referring to, you can click try web IDE. And then you basically get which is Studio in a browser. Um, I'm not sure it runs the newest version, but we should probably make sure it does. Cool. Um, where were we? <coughs> We're done. That's all from my side, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So you mentioned the template is dsugar to a type class or to yeah. a type class instance? Both. So like every template generates like one huge type class, like containing who are the signatories, like like a method for the signatories, a method for the servers, for this ensure clause we've seen for all the choices. Um, and then there's also an instance of this template class, um, like the class called template, which mm -hmm. contains create and fetch. And then there are instances for a class called choice, which contains the um, exercise keyword. So why does it need to be compiled to a or distributed to a type class? So I would have expected it to be distributed to a data type, maybe with some, and some functions. functions. Yeah. yeah. So um, the the answer is very really technical. We have those generic templates which need to be monomorphized because demo LF has only monomorphic templates. Okay. And that's kind of the way to transfer the type information from one module into another module. Okay. without putting something between the renamer and the type checker. So, yeah. Right. Very okay. technical. So we used to have the dsugar you're talking about. Yeah. And only recently added this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Generic templates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How have you been testing all this? Is it pre-check? Um, our tests are um, not really quick check tests, mostly like expectation tests. We have like a lot of demo code. We test and then we test for like what to expect, errors to expect, how the um, when you run the scenarios, how you expect to look, them to look like. Yeah. So more yeah. like unit tests, yeah. not uh, yeah. property tests. Yeah. Mm. We have like the property test for like some small bits and pieces mm. in there. Um, but the whole thing is mostly tested using unit tests. With the experience you have, would you recommend this approach for another Haskell-based DSO? It's um, easily portable? I think it's working quite well, yeah. Um, some people think it's like a Frankenstein, but I think it's a well-working Frankenstein. Um, <laughs> and GHC is slowly shifting towards this tree set grow approach. Um, I think if this ever would become unmaintainable, we can basically just plug, plug into the standard GHC AST. Um, but it's still like still growing in the tree set grow direction. So yeah, I can recommend it. And GHC core is like a very simple, insane intermediate language. So, yeah. But so you yeah. have to stick to some revision of do you follow the we, we, release? Follow, we follow the release version. Mm. Yeah. How much work is it to um, make it happen again? So we had to like revive GHC head, then we decided to go back to GHC 8.8, and now 
that there was a bit of work, but like moving forward seems to work okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're basically trying to do it every day, or like as, as often as possible, so that like the diffs don't become too big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our changes are not that many, mostly in the the other thing that you exploit that you have GHC as a library, so you don't oh, necessarily. I, you forgot that. Yeah. So thanks for reminding me. So we have a tool which basically takes the GHC, like uh, a clone of the GHC repository, and produces a cabal, like basically like an S disk mm -hmm. of the GHC. So it produces two things, like something just for the parser, and then something for the rest of the front end until the dsugar up and puts them into cabal packages. Um, All that allows it to do is to decouple your the binary you build with the GC parser from the GC parser that is used to actually build your binary. Because mm -hmm. usually if you use the GHC library, you get the one of the compiler that you use. Yeah. How many extensions are not possible to use in I mean, are not possible to yeah. use. Um, so we don't support anything related to existential tests, for instance. Um, basically, we've cut this, like, the intermediate language of GHC is uh, system FC, right? System F with uh, questions. 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 And we, we don't have, like, the coercion part. Um, that no. doesn't work. No unbox tuples. No, un well, that doesn't really matter because uh, demo F is a strict language. Maybe we don't support it now, but at runtime everything is boxed. So we would basically need to take your unboxed tuples and box them. Um, yeah. But I think that's, that's not something that is really adding accessibility. Um, we also don't have new types in demo F, we just turn them into records with one field. What about um, higher ranked types? Higher ranked, we have both higher ranked types and higher common types. Implicit? Uh, I don't want to talk about implicit. <laughs> <laughs> but I should work fine at the core of the call evaluation. Yeah. The way, so I don't think it matters. I think they, they, they should be. So if you turn around all the cool thing that has come out, like typed holes, um, well, actually, I, I'm not up to date anymore on the most recent extensions, but most of the stuff works. So with whatever is syntactic sugar, you get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think uh, the, the one thing I've been uh, asked for are uh, existential types, which would require some effort, and GDTs together with that. Where's the effort? We basically need to make them more LFC. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's worth it right now. Yeah, we'd also have the problem of that we need to understand how to serialize these existential types. Yeah, you would basically need to, like, you would end up with types on the ledger, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you have, like, existential data types. Um, so one of the design constraints which you try to keep is that whatever lands on the ledger is easily compatible to standard database schemas. Mm -hmm. And SQL is not that expressive. So we could, what we could do is like say you can't use those in like things that end up in the ledger. So you can use them only for internal stuff. But um, I, I think people have lived for very long without existential types. So, um, How do you deal with uh, schema updates? Like when you have a contract or a template uh, yeah. in a certain um, form and then um, you want to add some fields, say, or, or remove some fields. Yeah, so the idea is you can do that in demo itself. So let's say you have I don't know, like a contract with three fields and you want to add a fourth field. What you would do is you would, or what we're doing is we generate an upgrade contract which would consume an instance of this one and create an instance of this one. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to sign that you're okay with the upgrade. But kind of like we can do that in demo itself. And the hard question becomes, 
how do you generate good upgrade contracts automatically? Yeah. One of the interesting things there is like in, in an enterprise kind of setting, you can have all the signatories say, I agree for that person to upgrade my contract between this hour and that hour. So you can kind of batch for, you know, on this weekend, we're going to upgrade all the instances for everyone. So you can delegate that right to upgrade. And that's, oh, yeah. that's got a very cool feature that you get out of it. You can also kind of like say, I'm okay with this upgrade in general. Like upgrading from this contract to this contract model, I'm always okay for all my instances. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. The other part, which I believe we haven't seen in the demo, is that we address all code on the ledger in a content address fashion. So yeah. even if you have the same module with exactly the same types, but except for this one field, you get a different hash and you can't differentiate between the two versions. Yeah, yeah we have like nominal typing across the instances, no structural typing. So it's not like you, add, like you agree to something, then somebody adds a new choice, which does something that you never intended, like this doesn't happen because everything is tied, like all names, uh, everything is nominal. So actually, how do you read the things on the latch? On? This may be a stupid question because I don't understand yeah, no, the context question. very well, but so your demo gets converted into uh, uh, this demo lab lecture yeah. format, and then how do you look at it? So there's, there's an interpreter to, like executing the demo app, right. and when you do a fetch, calling into the ledger, I don't know, like your ledger could be a database or um, core, like quarter blockchain or whatever. So like, there's an API, and you call through this API, give you this data, and then you get it back. But how do you look? I mean, can you get back to some human readable uh, form of the smart contract? Or so like this, the smart contract is basically just like the record of the data right. and that is stored. So there's like a unityped value type and everything is turned into this unified thing and then stored on the ledger and then you, you pull it back out of the ledger and do some type checking where it's like your unitype thing actually matches what you expect. But the things on the ledger you cannot uh, get them in a human readable format. That you can turn Let me see well, the, the tables that you saw on the side. Right. Essentially, that's what you would see. You'd see yeah. here's a template maps into that kind of table, and you see here are the different um, instances that exist on the ledger. Can we have a look at the table? Because yeah, perhaps sure. what we didn't explain is that the state of the ledger is sure. a set of active contracts. Yes. An active contract has a pointer to the template that it instantiates and this unitype value of what was it instantiated with. So what you see here as individual tables is actually all sort of these tuples of, oh, I was this template with this data. That's how on the ledger the active contracts are actually stored. The pointers to templates, they point to this demo LF, which is not as nice a language as you see there, but still actually a readable language if you okay. wanted to. So I'm not sure whether you asked about the active contracts or the code that is on the ledger. Yeah. I mean both, I guess, okay. but you, you could conceivably have another language that also compiles to uh, DemoLF and then uh, submit that to the ledger. Mm -hmm. That would be totally conceivable. Can you show DemoLF? Can we pretty print it still? Mm -hmm. We can do that. We can print it, but it's not very pretty. Who's running the code actually? Like who's owning the machine? Who's running the code? Is that basically then distributed participants on the, on the blockchain? So that depends on what ledger you actually choose um, for your use case. Okay. So what you see here, the code that sort of is behind the scenario service, you can also run that in a sandbox mode, which is backed by Postgres. Mm -hmm. If if you have a standard case where you're or internal in an organization and you have a trusted IT department you probably have that department run the ledger mm -hmm. and you just deploy applications to it. But very well, it could also be, um, for example, Corda pretty soon. Mm -hmm. We're working on that. Uh, and then you have sort of the, the setup that Corda uses where you have multiple nodes run by different organizations and a notary that is run by an even different organization. And it's okay. these nodes and if you have a validating notary, that notary Wait. that run the demo code. The demo is actually nothing to do with like, distribution or like, no, like, but, social but, centralized. So what demo gives you well, is uh, an easy way to specify which state changes you allow on that lecture. Right. Mm. 
it also gives you a model of this what is this machine with permissions and authorizations and it, like the, it's the a metadata that you need. It's a state machine specification language. Mm -hmm. you, you write state machines with it. Mm -hmm. And then it also comes with a model of how a ledger should look like. I mean, that's what you see behind that, is that actually say, well, every contract mm -hmm. has associated information of who can see it. That's the privacy model. Mm -hmm. And which kind of changes can be authorized by whom. Mm -hmm. That's the authorization model. Okay. But to enforce that, that's basically dependent on the underlying technology. Exactly. Okay. So this is how the intermediate language looks like. Uh, it's kind of like it's very verbose. It looks like yeah, kind of like GHC core, uh, and like all those hashes we, is the content address. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the address of the standard library, is it? Um. Yes, that is the address of the standard library. Yeah. And one thing now that we're looking at your stuff here in the very end, there is this cache proposal template. <laughs> and then you see everything like frequency of server and shows. Sure. There's also agreements which I have not done today. Voices. Um, you see the there's every template actually gets a default archive choice. Yeah. Ah where all signatures need to approve, I believe. Exactly. Do we see that? Where's the controller for the archive? Um, sorry. Ah, by, isn't it? There. Yeah. So that basically says you're taking the controllers of something else. Yeah, you have to walk through the code to find it. There's a lot of indirections. There's, an, there's not too much uh, simplification going on. So this looks, yeah, pretty much like GHC core, and this looks like this bit in a slightly different way. And this will be stored on the blockchain, potentially forever. So how yeah. much is the artifact which is stored, actually? Um, depends on how much code you put in there. I think there's like one where you get like 80 max or something. Um, it's nine compressed. Okay. How large is this DAR file? Um, it's n the DAR file is a bit too large because it also includes all source code. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we want to look like at the DAL files which are embedded. Yeah. Yeah. The, the 9 megabyte compressed is a very large unit. It's a very, very large uh, piece mm -hmm. of logic. With tons of auto generated code, they basically take XML and generate DAM from it. Also, it depends on the underlying blockchain. There's some that you know, grow forever, and then there's some that can essentially archive history and, and remove that, and there's some that, um, so there are, there are all kinds of different ways to do it, but it's really important to active contract set. Mm -hmm. And then what you store as history is, is dependent on trust models that blockchain. Like for, for running it day to day, at some point you basically, like, when you do this continuous upgrades, which we were talking about earlier, at some point you lose all references to specific packages, right? And then you can basically garbage collect them and you only need them for auditing. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to like replay the history and make sure everything works out well. And there's another trick which you can exploit here in Danwell because you have, for all contracts, you know the stakeholders. You can actually have the stakeholders of the currently active contracts agree that they drop the audit trail. Because it's, it's, it's really all bilateral. It's not mm. this one big set of validators which always need to prove to everybody um, that everything was done correctly. That, though, depends on what ledger you implement. I mean, if, if we map this on something like Daml on Fabric, then we inherit Fabric's capabilities, and that wouldn't be a capability that it has. Mm. Yes, uh, are we trying to verify the, like, formally verify the properties of the language? Um, not yet. We've been asked about it, but it's not really clear what people mean when they ask for verification. Okay. Um, like, what, what do we have in mind? Uh, like, um, like, uh, is it the whole verification of like the, the model, basically, of the, of the whole system, and then 
probably we need to build a model, model of the blockchain and then we prove the properties of the right language. What are the properties? Um, right. like things okay. like you don't do double spends or things like um, there's no cash disappearing or disappearing out of thin air, things like that. I mean, I read, I read some, um, some blog posts by you guys, I think, on Medium and they said, yeah, any language for, um, for like distributed ledger thing has to have certain properties, like what was that? Any contract that is entered has to be entered voluntarily and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, so we have, and you say that these are properties of the language, basically. Yeah. So things like that. So when you wrote the the, the blog post, that was true. <laughs> right now. <we're> <laughs> the, 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 the properties are true. The the. Yeah. Verification. I mean, we had yeah. an attempt at that, but it wasn't. Well, actually, we need to be yeah. more specific here in this. So, what we have actually is a formal model of what we call the ledger model. And there, for example, that these authorization properties actually guarantee, so the local authorization checks guarantees the, the global voluntary or, uh, authorization, is one thing that, that we do check. Okay. Well, we um, check it at one time. Yeah. No, we did have an attempt to the form of verification of the runtime itself. And that the ROI was with the, the company. Yeah, that was before my time, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a problem with verifying. You can basically verify all the way down, and then at the end you have to verify the net, uh, network as well and all these things. So. Yeah. Yeah, it would turn it around. So when does verification pay off? It pays off if you find bugs that would cost a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there we, we get this question of, well, which bugs do we need to eliminate now? How much can we invest to eliminate them? And what I would still claim very much is that the language itself, how it's set up, is well suitable for formal verification. Like, I mean, if you look at this core language, we could directly leverage the work that has been done on the GHC pipeline verification because they're nicely aligned. But it needs to be done. And right now, I don't think actually that is a good investment for a company. Okay. Oh, but that then maybe follow up with uh, how far is the development of the whole the panel, like infrastructure? Um, what, what like, what is it already used by, I don't know, banks? So, the Australian Stock Exchange, exchange is building a new settlement system based on it. Okay. Um, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is about to start doing the same. Oh. Are they building a settlement uh, different, system? Different, okay. different system, but... Uh, okay. Yeah, maybe you can answer system. that. Yeah, I mean, well, the infrastructure really is that's uh, Simon can answer, but in terms of people using it, um, large financial institutions are building things. The, okay. the stock exchange is supposed to go live in 2021, so it's, it's a very long phase. Uh, phase. But at that point, all of the uh, all of the listing about stock in Australia will be on, on this country, so the infrastructure is uh, starting to get pretty stable, and okay. still working on it, in terms of readiness for general availability. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, for, as I said, for different use cases, you want to select a fitting ledger. Um, the one which you can use right off the bat if you want to try it out is a demo on Postgres. So that's included in the SDK. You can just run the, we call it the sandbox because yeah, you can play around it. Uh, and you can enable persistence. So point it to Postgres server and you get persistence there. Now that that is not a blockchain, but I think that is a very viable storage target for actually your coordination of multi-party processes. Then if you want sort of an enterprise ledger, what you're going to get next year is that you can get it from VMware as a managed service. So they have their blockchain working together with them to integrate Daml there. That is also one of the candidates that ASX can go live with. And the other thing which I would like to mention, I mean, we have also done all the proof of concepts that Daml works on Fabric, that he works on Sawtooth. That one is gonna come out sort of for commercially supported probably towards Q1 next year. They're both open source right now. But They're we, both open source, yes. Yeah. Sawtooth is the one, if you, if you want a blockchain, use the open source Sawtooth one. And the other thing that I would like to mention is uh, Canton. Um, have a look at canton.io. That is a ledger which really exploits the properties of Tamil. So what I talked about like with the um, dropping of audit data, that is well possible there because it really exploits this property that all contracts are between parties and each party essentially can manage all its contracts by itself and just make sure that whenever it does a state transition it is coordinated with all the other stakeholders that need to be involved. 
Um, that that's a take a very different take on on blockchain and DLT, which I believe is very strong. Okay. Execution engine, uh, it's not written in Haskell, right? No, um, it's written in Scala. Like the whole ledger server is running on JVM, okay. so an interpreter for that model is written in Scala. Mm -hmm. What are the plans for moving to Haskell? It was once written in Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's a toy implementation in, in Rust as well, but that's not feature complete. The historical rationale, which you know, sometimes we need to decide if that was a good one or a bad one, but the historical rationale was that the early customers we had were very, very comfortable um, operating during JVM big stacks. Mm -hmm. um, so they weren't comfortable with Haskell and their knowledge of how to run that, and they were very comfortable with JVM big stacks. So looking for what's, what was Close enough to Haskell, but they be in base. And about performance and inspection of execution, you can't make use of the RTS. You mean of DHCs, right? Yeah. Yeah. So right now we, we you can't really do runtime inspection because you get like crashes. <laughs> Um, yeah, but there's no runtime uh, inspection yet. But we're still working on um, tools to make it ready for enterprise use case. But you wouldn't want to use the GHC RTS. Like, one of the things that you really want is you want to be able to comfortably execute untrusted code. So, and the GHC RTS essentially is built for speed, but you actually do trust sort of the code that is there. So that's, that's why we decided go for interpreter really keep under control what kind of I.O. can be done. But it, we pay the price of making sure that this interpreter sort of supports in the development workflow well. It's a simple CK machine. I mean, Martin knows, knows the internals quite well, actually. Yeah, it's a simple CK machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually a CESK machine, because it's storage as well. So can you do I.O. on a laptop, like open network connection? Nope. It's <laughs> well. That depends on what you want to do. Yeah. If you like, if you want to write things that do I/O, um, you can basically talk to the ledger API, kind of like send commands. Like kind of so if you want to do I/O, you yield a contract that says, "Okay, give this party the choice to provide the data," mm -hmm. and thereby you also sort of make sure that you make it explicit who is the one that you trust to provide the correct data. And if you feel like you want the negotiation of one provides the data and the other one says, yes, I'm okay with it, you code that up as well. But you could not depend on some kind of web service to give you some event to propagate your state machine one step further. So I think we need to clarify the you here. So if, if you say, I want to write, I want to provide a service via demo, mm -hmm. uh, so you a service company, then what you can obviously do is you write a ledger API based application on your side that sort of monitors the, the contracts that come in and if there's mm -hmm. a contract that says um, mm -hmm. okay. I have an invoice for you, mm -hmm. you do a quick risk check and say okay yeah this guy he's not gonna, he, he's okay I know him and you pay it automatically or you go and get um, the core stock exchange data from the internet. You can have like a trusted weather service that's just ticking the, you know, yeah, the weather exactly. and putting that on, on the ledger, and it's the sole signatory of that. It's a exactly. data contract. It's basically have to trust somebody. And to you provide can, that yeah, data. Like I say, I refer to the weather data, which is you know, which is produced by that producer. Probably also it shows one distinction which we make very explicit. We distinguish between rules, which are on the ledger, and strategy or automation, which is off ledger. Mm. If if you look at something like Ethereum, you usually have both of it coupled. You have a nice sort of automation interface. Like if, if you trigger a workflow, it goes and does everything for yourself. Here it's like, okay, mm. we coordinate on the ledger who needs to do what when, mm. but how these parties do it, that's their job. Okay. Is it actually possible to run liquid Haskell on the disk? In general, yes. Mm -hmm. We have not tried it yet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see why it should not be. Because it's also, it it's pretty much uses the front end of the GHC pipeline. It doesn't depend on the back end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's Is there quite... Is verification of what the 
code looks like, the decreasing recursion steps and stuff like that. But I cannot loop forever in my contract. You can, uh, but I it's can. yeah. That that's a very interesting argument. For a long time, if you if you look at the the blog posts out there on, on blockchains, they're like, ah, oh, it needs to be Turing incomplete, uh, otherwise we have a problem. But look at what you can do with, even if you're guaranteed to terminate, you can still take H's. So you actually want this sort of quick response time or bounded resource consumption. And there, the, the approach which we take, but yes, we still have to finish it, is that actually um, you bound the execution limit, the amount of execution that a contract can do. So you don't yeah, do it statically. It's yeah, it's a gas-based approach. Mm -hmm. There's a, that's another reason why having a, like an interpreter for your language mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. handy. Like you can track all allocations. You can exactly count steps in your interpreter. And what happens if a contract is locked in such a state and it runs out of gas? Uh, it's Daml specifies what transactions can be applied to the ledger. So um, this, the thing which Martin usually skipped over, that's the transaction and what Damos, yeah, actually if you, if you look at it, so you saw him specify exercise transfer. That's the command which you would send to the ledger API which mm -hmm. a single party authorizes. That command gets expanded by the Daml interpreter to full transaction. Transaction itself, you don't need to execute any Daml to apply it. What you need to execute Daml for is to check whether the transaction follows the model that was specified. So now what could be is that somebody submits a transaction with too low resource limits to check that transaction, mm -hmm. and then it would just not be applied. Okay, check the transaction will be rejected. Will not yes, be so that the contract can't, uh, can't advance. Now what could mm -hmm. happen is that a contract only has choices which are very expensive to advance, so de facto actually it is stuck. But if you look at archive choice, which you always generate, that's always cheap. So you can always archive that one, replace the code, oh. mm -hmm. if, if the stakeholders agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the research consumption doesn't exist yet at the future state. Mm -hmm. Right now there isn't a... Is recording? You're still recording, we're at exactly 1.30. Any more questions? Well, this will be a cabal for a uh, demo, so that you can package up codes and maybe, maybe also like a hackage for uh, for demo. Um, we, we we don't have it yet, but it's part of our goals for the next, for like for the rest of this year. Um, kind of into the essential package repository. One thing which is slightly different here is kind of like. If you have those long running, like if you have a ledger running somewhere, it's like if you package this up the root already. Kind of like maybe you want to use those as your central package repository. Right? Kind of like if the AS, when the ASX goes live with their system, they have this ledger running and there are like some packages uploaded. And then maybe they open, or hopefully they open the API and you can start writing stuff against their ledger. And then your package manager would basically be what is already uploaded. Right. Um, yeah. So all the packages known on this ledger. That would be one thing, and another thing would be maybe, maybe you also want to use some utility like those coming from somewhere. Right. So um, I think the situation is kind of like slightly different, and we need to like figure out how those things interact with each other. And then there's also like the question of like vetting packages. Maybe you can only use packages via ASX as a lead. So, so sorry, maybe here I have this conceptual gap again, but your, your demo libraries, they are written in demo, I assume? Yes. And the things that the, the stock exchange uploads to the ledger are written in the uh, demo, what LF. is it, LF? Yeah. So how do you know that the library you have will produce exactly the demo LF that's on the ledger, or...? Um, so, I think there are multiple answers to this question. One is, 
you can basically program against them or that. We can basically regenerate the interface, like the has the demo like interface from the demo or that. Okay. That is a way for old stuff. And the other one is um, you can compile, so if the compiler is deterministic, you can compile against the sources. And you can generate the interface from the sources of the other library, yeah. and you can check it's the same that is on the ledger. So someone can give you the source code, and yes. then you can check yourself that it's mm. actually... Yeah. See? Okay. Yeah. And you can also program against something where you don't know the source code. But you need to know some, right, right. some interface to program. And you can also reuse the type level at that point. Yeah. So you can you basically only get the the, um, the template. You don't really get the functions. That sounds very hard to then trust that your contract is doing what you actually want it to do. So you can do you, like you need to do some sort of auditing, right, to make that sure. And you can do that on demo level. Or you can also do it on the demo at that level, which is like still human readable. It's probably less of a pleasure than doing it on the demo level, but uh, it's doable. Okay. Yeah. Should we move on to uh, drinks and food? So uh, thanks again, Martin. Thank you. <laughs>